Well, it is good to be back. In case you forgot, I'm Juno. I'm the, uh, the lead guy here. I spent some time in, in Michigan and some time in Arizona. But it's interesting, in Michigan it was 75 degrees and hot. And when I arrived in Arizona, it was cold and rainy. And when I got back home here, I had to turn the furnace on. And so I think there's something wrong with our weather and our temperature. But I had a uh, time of rest, and so I'm grateful for that. Able to spend some time with my daughter, who now lives in Phoenix. Uh, hung out with her on what would have been my wife's uh, birthday, as well as I concluded my vacation by another time, another day with, with my daughter on what would have been my wife's, uh, uh, her promotion to heaven, the day she died. And so we just hung out together, and my daughter probably needs to uh, look at the alternative gift fair because she spent the day taking me Christmas shopping for her. <laughs> okay, Dad, here's what I want. And I did say, if I ever get remarried, your gift list is going to shrink tremendously. Uh, and she assured me she was confident that even if I did, now I'm not, but if I <laughs> did choose to, to, uh, to spend my life with somebody again, that she would still be spoiled beyond belief. But anyway, so it is good to be home here. And there is no doubt, as I was traveling and, you know, I hung out with a bunch of buddies who are ministers and we talked shop and we compared notes and we talked about what was happening in their church, what isn't happening in their churches, what needs to happen in their churches. And it is great to be back home here. It is great uh, again, I know I've said this before, I think, when I arrive in Michigan, it is a different culture. Uh, there's something beautiful about the diversity that we have here. And uh, it's just, this just seems home, natural, uh, and a great place to be. So uh, I'm glad to be here and glad to be back and... Uh, it's really good to be home. Hey, I also, on uh, Friday of this week, I sent out an email for some uh, opportunities for us. Uh, again, as Mark went over, all the different uh, opportunities for us to, to either serve in. Opportunities for us to invite our friends to. And opportunities for us to give to. And so I shared about our Thanksgiving offering project that we have going. So if you don't get email, you can pick up that letter in the lobby or at the guest center and be caught up to date. Well, this morning we are continuing our study uh, in the New Testament from the book of James. And it is a book that is saying more ways than one that our faith needs to, to be a faith of action. That if we're claiming that the God of the world has come into our life and changed our hearts and transformed us, that somehow... That needs to be exhibited by what we do. And I think it's, it's easy and uh, natural for us to assume, well, if Jesus was here saying this, or if James himself was, was telling us this, that of course we'd get it right. Of course we would know what to do to put our faith in action. And yet the reality is, James has written this book. To remind the church, the church long ago, that they got to keep some things in line. And that our faith is more than a personal belief system. But our faith really needs to, to transform our heart, which transforms the things that we do. And so, uh, that's comforting to know. That if the early church blew it on some things, that, hey, we're not called to be perfect uh, we're just called to, to continue to strive for the things that God wants us to do. So let me pray as we begin. Again, Lord, for your presence here, thank you. Uh, for the folks here uh, who make up new life, thank you. For the diversity that we have, thank you. For those who have come in this morning, maybe thinking, ah, I'll just blow off today, or I can watch it uh, some other way, or I'll catch it later. Thank you. Thank you that they, they made the efforts. Uh, thank you that they bring into this place 
the burdens of their hearts and the concerns of their lives and that you meet each and every one of us here. And so I just simply pray that the thoughts that your people here today are thinking and the words that come from my mouth will be acceptable in your sight because you are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. So we're going to start right off with, with James 5. And it's from James 5, 1 through 6 are the verses for this morning. It's on page 849 in the, in the Bible in front of you. And if you need that, it is free. Take it home with you. Again, uh, not to sit it on the coffee table, but to read it. And to make sure what the guy up front saying lines up with, with what the scripture is. And in that process, you yourself will become more aware of God's word and God's character. So let's take a look at chapter 5, verse 1. Let me read this to you. Now listen, you rich people. Weep and wail because of the misery that is coming on you. Your wealth has rotted and the moths have eaten your clothes. Your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. You have hoarded wealth in the last days. Look, the wages you failed to pay the workers who mowed your fields are crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. You have lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fatted yourselves, fattened yourselves in the day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the innocent one who was not opposing you. So I come back from vacation and I have to talk about money, you know, and what is this talking about? And I really think that in the church that money is the new dirty four-letter word. I know it's five letters. <laughs> Must be that new math or I was never good at spelling. Uh, but it's really the, the subject that, that the, 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 the sheer mention of it, some of your radars go, ding, 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 ding. Here he goes again. Well, this is what everybody else talks about. But I want us to take a, a good look at what James is really talking about. And really, folks, uh, while we at times get a little anxious about the subject, some of that may be righteous guilt that you sh maybe should be feeling, the subject of money is talked about almost more than anything else in all of Scripture. And so to ignore it would be a dishonoring aspect of, of my calling to God's Word. But I really want to address up front an assumption about this guy, James, and what he uh, is writing about. And I think if we look quickly, without much effort, and just read through this passage, we could think that, that James has an issue with wealth. We could think that James has an axe to grind against the people who have money. I just want to say that, again, is a false conclusion. And while James addresses the subject of money and riches, let's remember to keep his thoughts in context of his whole writing and what he is referring to. Again, you can go home and you can, you can read the beginning part of this book of James. Because in James 1, you're going to see that, that James, his point was that the rich who depend upon their riches meaning if everything I have is dependent, no, if my self-esteem is dependent on what I have, not a good thing. So James addresses that. In chapter 2, he, he again, it's nothing critical about the rich. James is critical of the people who show preferences to those with resources. Meaning if I love you more, if I allow you certain privileges just from the reality that your paycheck is bigger than mine or bigger than others, James says, ah, not a good thing. James is not upholding perpetual poverty. 
meaning James isn't saying uh, to be poor is better in God's eyes. The reality is he's, he's teaching this to, to the majority of people who are very, very poor financially and very little uh, material things. And it's not sounding an alarm to be against those with money. And so I think if we read all of Scripture too quickly, at times we can jump to conclusions that we have pre, uh, preset in our own minds or what we really want the Bible to say. So as we look at this book, and especially these passages, it is important that, uh, that we read them in context. Because to pull them out of context, and you may have heard that term, you know, uh, James is talking here, but we just take a couple words out and make a passage, make a sermon out of it. To take something out of context is really an improper and a very poor way to read God's word. And so again, we need to read the entire paragraph and, and think about what it says. And we need to include all the relevant biblical passages that we see in all of Scripture. Again, the point is, folks, that rich people are not bad. That is, uh, uh, that's not the point. And I think at times, we can read that into it. But really, it is a, uh, a passage that talks about uh, the improper use of resources. It's a passage that talks about the improper use of power that often comes with the blessing of resources. And so let's just uh, uh, look again and, and think about it. And I found as I was, was reading through this that my, my big question is, who is James talking to in this passage? Because I can, uh, because we know that for the most of it, that he's talking to the church. But yet there is just something about this passage that uh, makes you wonder. And so there, there's a couple things that I really want to, to, to bring to our attention. And, and one of those is that, uh, who's he talking to? Well, I am going to say he's not talking to believers in this section. He doesn't address the believers in this section. In fact, if you read through the book of James, and I'm going to read off a bunch of numbers and uh, chapters and verses. You can look them up at home. Uh, but James is often saying, hey, brother, brothers and sisters. He is referring directly to the church. And you can look at that in James 1, 2. In James, uh, the first chapter in James verse 19, and the second chapter in James, verses 1 and 14, and the third chapter in James, verses 1 and 10, the fourth chapter in James, verses, uh, the verse 11. Again, James is a short book, folks. You could read all that this week, and you'll see a pattern there in how James is addressing the church, but that pattern is broke in verse, in chapter 5. He doesn't he, it appears that he is not addressing the church. So I don't want us to get off the hook with that. But it's important to keep that in mind. And James also often talks about repentance. To the believer, he talks about, you know, repentance to stop and change and turn. But in this chapter, in this part of the chapter, it's really more about condemnation. And so since they're not believing in the values that the believers do, uh, he doesn't talk about redemption, which is interesting. So again, that leads me to believe that this is written to the non-believers. This section of chapter 5, and then next week, chapter 7, I mean, uh, verse 7 starts off with, be patient, brothers and sisters. So again, then he's talking to believers. Here he's talking to some folks who have been absolutely uh, uh, immoral, probably, 
and how they have used their, their riches to beat up on people, to take advantage of people. And that's what we need to look at here this morning. So moving to verses uh, 2 and 3. Your wealth has rotted and moths have eaten your clothes. You know, they didn't have mothballs back then. Uh, your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. You have hoarded wealth in the last days. Again, James is addressing the things that, that are very visible, that are an exhibit that, that show of wealth. What you wear the clothing that you have on, the things you have that will soon just disintegrate or fall apart. And then he swings the pendulum the other way and talks about uh, gold and silver, which, which seldom will corrode, but he says, you know, that's not going to give you uh, the things in life. That's not enduring for all of eternity. And so he gives a word of warning about everything that what may appear to be signs of success. And so while he's again addressing the wealthy landowners and, and uh, farmers, of which very few of us, they've all moved out to Chino, but uh, uh, very few of us probably fit into that particular category. But all of us at times gain our self-worth, I think, from the things we have. So there is no doubt that what James is talking about, we need to process ourselves in, in the world in which we live into. And James continues, and he says, uh, look, on, on verse 4, look, the wages you failed to pay the workers who mowed your fields are crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. Folks, and what was happening here is uh, an arrangement was made with workers and the rich folks never paid them. They just stiffed them. And so again, the poor workers who had nothing to, for their daily bread... After this arrangement with the rich people who owned all the land, the, the, the landowners paid them nothing. Now, I doubt any of us, if we're a business owner, would treat people that way today. But it is, again, a reminder for each of us that uh, we are fair and any of us in management, that we are fair in what we pay those who work for us. But again, uh, it says here, the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. Folks, you know, many of you are either grandparents or parents. And you know, you can mess with us. But if you mess with our kids, our grandkids, my guess is, even if you're really patient... It hits, it, it, it pushes your buttons. You hear your grandkids weep and cry about their, their little brother who picked on them or their big brother who's picking on them or the bully, uh, the bully in school saying something to your son or to your daughter and you get home and you want to go and you want to teach him a lesson. A little confession there. Uh, Think about this in the sense of James is writing and saying that God is hearing the cries of his kids. And folks, I don't know about you, but you know, you take off one of one of God's children and God hears their cries. I just pity the person who is in that position. And so all of us are God's children. And God hears all of our cries. And it is a reminder that God will, will take revenge. That God will deal with the unjustly. And again, I pity the person in that position. And then here, uh, 
And I think, folks, this is probably for me the most uh, difficult verse in this short passage. Verse 5. You have lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened yourselves in the day of the slaughter. Because even in our own world, I think uh, my junk may be your riches. As I clean out my garage and put, bring things here for the student yard sale, someone's going to think they struck it gold for things that I'm just thinking, ah, I don't need this stuff anymore. And so I really do, do feel that, uh, that the idea of, of indulgence and, and overextending and, and living in luxury is really subjective. Because no matter, I mean, in this room, I could name a brand of a car, and some of you would say, oh, that's the low end of the uh, uh, totem pole for vehicles. And others of you would feel absolutely thrilled and rich to be driving that particular vehicle. And so I, what I take from this is the idea of not for me not to be looking at others and judging others for what they have, but to be continually looking at my own heart and saying, okay, God, am I more dependent on you or on my wallet? And this just reminds me, this whole passage is, is, reminds me of a call, even in our, in our season here, even though it's an American season, our season of Thanksgiving, to be grateful for what I have. And not to use my position of wealth, even though I'm not a landowner, uh, to exploit others. But what am I doing to help others develop and use their gifts? What am I doing to make sure that I'm not casting judgment on those that have less than I do and that I'm not casting judgment on those who have more than I do? So again, James is talking to a group of people who, who have used their wealth and their power to exploit, to beat up on, to keep in, in their uh, low positions of need uh, people. And James is saying, time out. Not good. Because you have caused, it cl- concludes with, you have condemned and murdered the innocent one who was not opposing you. What th- That could be taken two ways. That they have condemned Jesus, who did nothing. And then in the context of this, it could also be taken as the poor people who have done absolutely nothing but have agreed to their contract with you. You have withheld their, their earnings to the, to the point of starvation. And James is saying, whoa. And again, for most of us here, we're going to say, that's not us. That's not me. Either I don't employ somebody or I am not on the top end of the pay scale. So we'll just skip and I can't wait to hear what happens next week. But yeah, I think it's important that if, uh, if we, in this season, again, of Thanksgiving, that we remember that in our own culture, in our own uh, artesia, bellflower, cerritos world, Living in the United States, by most people's standards, we are very wealthy. We are uh, way above the poverty line. Most of us have heard these statistics. That America controls 20% of the world's wealth, yet only 5% of the population is here in America. Over One billion people in the world do not have access to clean water, and yet here in America, we use 100 to 150 gallons of water a day. That while we throw away 14% of our food, every seven seconds, a child under the age of five dies in this world from hunger. Nearly one people in the world live on less than one American dollar a day. And another two and a half billion on less than two dollars a day. According to the study I read, in the average American teenager spends $150 a 
a week. And we spend more on trash bags in our country than nearly half the world does in all of their goods that they need 